Wonderful. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Uh, we're so delighted to see you here. This is a very high-level panel for what will be a quite interesting discussion on risk and on building resilience to protect ourselves from what we know are just all of the increasing shocks and uncertainties that we're confronting uh, all around the world, whether we're talking about earthquakes or floods or droughts, heat waves or wildfires, uh, cyclones, hurricanes, tsunamis. I think if we went around the room, we could all name at least one in each category that's happened somewhere in the world, maybe in the last 12 months. Um, Certainly our technology is more advanced than ever, but we still aren't able to predict where and when every shock will occur. And so we don't have control over all of the risks, but we do have control potentially over the amount of damage that will be incurred and how rapidly our systems will be able to rebound and to restore function. Um, what many of us call the concept of resilience, and we'll be talking about that today. Um, there are many reasons why this is becoming even more urgent. The first is really rapid urbanization. Um, we all know the statistics. It's predicted that by 2050, um, about three quarters of the world's population will be living in cities, um, and many of those are on low-lying coastal regions or on fragile ecologies. Um, by the same year, 136 of the world's largest cities could be facing annual flood losses of about a trillion U.S. dollars. Um, and those who are most likely to suffer are poor or vulnerable people who simply don't have the resources, economic or, or other kinds of resources, um, to rebound more quickly. Uh, and we at the Rockefeller Foundation have been working uh, quite a bit on building urban resilience uh, around the world. But we recognize that resilience um, isn't just a concern for urban areas. In rural areas, especially in the developing world, where three-fourths of the people rely on, their, uh, on agriculture for their livelihoods, entire communities really could thrive or tank um, on the basis of their vulnerability due to weather events. The World Bank reports that by 2030, there could be 325 million people trapped in poverty and vulnerable um, because of weather-related events in sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. So the um, extent of this problem and the impact on people is really quite extraordinary and, and demands global and local attention. Um, and all of the sectors are impacted, certainly the private sector, experiences both direct and indirect losses. Um, I was in New York after Superstorm Sandy and chaired the recovery commission for Governor Cuomo. And it was really astonishing, even though New York felt well prepared to see the impact on business, um, the stock exchange closed down for two days and the like. Um, besides direct hits, industry can also feel the impacts in their supply chains, which, as we know, are global in scope. So the Bangkok floods, the tsunami in Japan, took down global supply chains that affected business all over the world. So the business consequences of this are quite profound. And then, of course, the consequences for government that are bearing the cost and the responsibility um, for rebuilding after each shock. And so we've got to start thinking differently and try to do better than just disaster, rebuild, recover, disaster. So how are we building in both our responses and, and a kind of new narrative um, that really can enable a more effective rebound? Um, our esteemed panelists are going to help us find the answers to those questions. Um, to introduce them briefly, Baroness Valerie Amos is the Undersecretary General for Humanitarian Affairs and Emergency Relief Coordinator for the United Nations and also serves on the Forum's Global Agenda Council on Catastrophic Risks. Gregory Domingo, um, our colleague in the middle, is the Secretary of Trade and Industry of the Philippines. Uh, he's the advisor to the President of the Philippines on all issues related to trade and investments and industry, and is the President's special envoy to the World Economic Forum at this meeting. Laurent Salvador Lamoth is the Prime Minister of Haiti. Minister Lamoth served as the Minister of Foreign Affairs and Worship, and has also been a 
very noted leader in the telecommunications sector as the co-founder and former CEO of the company Global Voice Group. Nahid Nenshi is the mayor of Calgary, Canada. Mayor Nenshi's leadership is really very well regarded uh, in his first term, he's now in his second term, has resulted in so many positive changes in Calgary, building better communities and really transforming the way government works. He's the lead author of Building Up, making Canada's cities magnets for talent and engines for development. Sandra Wu Wen Xiu is the chairperson and chief executive for Kokusai Kogyo, which works on infrastructure in Japan, and they are noted for their um, excellence in building community-oriented, low-carbon, safe and secure, people and environmentally friendly cities um, that really are able to cope with disasters. And they focus on three core strengths, which I think are essential as we have this conversation, infrastructure, renewable energy, and geospatial information technology. So you see we have a lot of global expertise in this room, um, people who have directly been on the ground confronting these challenges uh, and um, really can help us to think through this, this issue. So I'm going to start with you, Valerie, if I may. The UN's a large organization. It has so many different agencies and regional stakeholders, all of whom function in a period after uh, providing emergency relief. Can you talk about the challenges of coordinating the various responders, what mechanisms you have in your place to ensure that there really is a good chain of command, that there's the right communications to make sure that aid is really deployed most effectively? Uh, thanks very much, Judith, and um, I'm very pleased to be part of this panel. But before I answer your question specifically, um, let me just say one general thing, of which course. I think is very important. Uh, because the United Nations, as with many uh, uh, countries, and particularly uh, donors, have tended to focus on we've got a humanitarian arm and we've got a development arm. Uh, and there are agencies that work on both, but the structures tend to be quite different. So our development colleagues work on a sort of longer term trajectory, uh, doing more programmatic work. And on the humanitarian side, we tend to be uh, much more immediate. And what we have been trying to do for the last few years is to say that actually this is not how communities and countries experience disaster. You know, we have this kind of bureaucratic structure, but the reality is that that's not how countries function, and that essentially is not how communities function. Mm -hmm. So uh, you don't go to a community uh, that then says, well, actually, I'm in a humanitarian phase right now, uh, and in a week or so, I'll be in a development phase. People are actually experiencing those things simultaneously. So we've been working uh, very hard through the concept of resilience and... Uh, trying very hard not to get into def defining too clearly what resilience is because it means so many different things to different people and you could end up talking forever but saying we know it when we see it and actually trying to change our practice on the ground. Um, so now to come to what is quite a difficult bit of your question which is how does the coordination work. The coordination uh, can be extremely difficult which is why you have an agency like mine, whose job is to work to coordinate, uh, to work with the governments, to work with the regional organizations, but also to work with UN colleagues and partner organizations on the ground. A very good example is what happened recently in the Philippines, which is it's very clearly a government-led effort that we come in behind to support. In uh, some other countries, and the Prime Minister will uh, know this even better than I do, in the aftermath of 2010 in Haiti, because so many structures were destroyed, so many uh, crucial people who were essential to the recovery effort uh, uh, and part of government departments either lost their lives or were busy trying to uh, secure their families and communities, the international community kind of rushed in and almost took over. And I, and I think it led to uh, a dissonance uh, in the relationship uh, which we have painstakingly had to rebuild because part of our job is to support government-led efforts. And it becomes difficult when the government uh, is itself facing uh, uh, challenges and coordination challenges. And Haiti is probably the best example recently of a major coordination 
uh, challenge that it was very difficult to pull together. And I think we're working uh, much more closely and more effectively on, on, on doing that. But when you have a large scale disaster, uh, the coordination challenges are significant and you have to invest uh, the resources uh, and the people to do the coordination. So, Prime Minister, maybe I can turn to you because that is the obvious lead-in to the question of when you really are on the ground, you're running the country or you're running the city, um, and disaster strikes and all of this humanitarian aid flows in from all over the world, which of course is, is very welcome and, and wonderful and important, but how do you integrate the local on the ground organizations that have been in place or the government structures and planning strategies that have been in place with this infusion of aid and goodwill? Well, that's a very good question. Um, in Haiti, has we had our share of natural disasters. In 2010, we had, uh, of course, the devastating earthquake. We've had a drought in 2011. We've had uh, uh, the superstorm yeah. Sandy hit Haiti before actually it hit um, New York, and that was also a major a major disaster for us. And and the the location that we have is of course cyclone prone. Um, one of the big challenges, of course, that we've faced is how to prepare better. So improving the preparedness, improving um, the coordination, and working on it year round. Not only waiting for the disaster to strike, but also creating a system, and we've created the, the National Risk and Disaster Management um, Agency, and then from there, we have the, the Civil Protection Agency that, you know, we're working on it year round in order to be prepared um, for a disaster coming. And what we've done as well is we put out a new building code that allow people, that give people the direction, the zoning, in order to build better and that's one of the major problems that we had during the earthquake is not the earthquake itself that was disastrous is the building mm -hmm. because you know it was done you know in a in an unstructured way and uh, and the houses were vulnerable right now we're building back better the government is you know the reconstruction has begun all the the new structures are respecting um, building codes um and you know we are investing also in risk mitigation. We we are doing riverbed protection to over 50 rivers in Haiti to avoid systematic flooding. We we managed to invest over 30 million dollars into the drainage system, into into the into the capital. Um, we are unclogging some of the clogs that we've had for years. For for some 30 years, the ditches were not being uh, drained, and we managed to. Uh, to do that, and we're finalizing it in June this year, that will help uh, us being more resilient. And also, the aid coordination is a big, is a has been a big challenge because if there is a if there is a, a disaster, one of the biggest problems is how to uh, receive, how to absorb some of the the assistance that we're getting. Mm -hmm. And you know, we, with the UN, with a lot of NGOs. We are doing it year round. We have a, a disaster management system that we put in place, and we have the different agencies present, um, working together, and also building a plan, um, basically to to avoid being in an emergency mode when the the, the disaster strikes. So, I, so I believe the preparedness, mm -hmm. the organization, the right building codes, um, everything that mitigates the risk is what we're focusing on right now, so that because we know it's going to happen again, to be better prepared. Um, Mayor Nenshi, maybe you can pick up at the more local level. Sure. So this is what a national government is doing. How does the city government think about and engage in this kind of preparedness and building? Um, and how do you expect to interact both in Canada with your state government and your national government, as well as whatever foreign actors are, are there to help in times of need? Sure, you know, it may seem strange for me to speak after the Prime Minister of Haiti um, about the natural disaster that we faced seven months ago in Calgary. But I think it's important for us to remember that natural disaster is not just cataclys cataclysmic things that face the developing world in humanitarian crisis, but it's natural disaster can face all of us. It was just seven months ago uh, that we had our devastating flooding in Calgary, a river that normally runs at 30 cubic meters per second 
uh, through the city was running at 700 to 1200 cubic meters per second uh, through the city. Uh, $6 billion of damage to private and public infrastructure, meaning that flood recovery in my city and my province would in fact be the largest public works project in our history. And so I think is important is to understand is that at the local government level, there are three phases we have to work through. One is immediate response, keeping people safe and alive, um, dealing with evacuations, figuring out how to get people back in their homes. And in this case, we were very lucky. You know, we're in a place in the Canadian prairies at the foot of the Rocky Mountains where we don't get cyclones or typhoons, an occasional tornado, um, but certainly we're not immune uh, to the forces of nature. But we were ready in terms of our response. We evacuated 100,000 people overnight. There was only one casualty within the city limits, which I still say is one too many. Uh, and we were able to get people back into their homes quite quickly. So the, the response phase, I think we were able to manage well. The recovery phase, in terms of rebuilding that what was lost. You know, my city lost about a half a billion dollars in public infrastructure, roads, bridges, and so on. And that's where the other orders of government become very important. Because municipal governments anywhere never have the resources in order to be able to manage this. So uh, a tripartite uh, relationship between insurance companies, regional governments, and federal governments um, becomes incredibly important. And in fact, I have to say all three of those in the Canadian context have been very help helpful. The tough part is the title of this session in the third phase, resilience. We probably have in my city another half a billion dollars of resilience projects that need to be built dams upstream of the city, and the biggest one we're looking at is a diversion tunnel, which goes underneath an existing built-up city. Now think about that for a moment as a policymaker. Half a billion dollars, how much public transit could I build for half a billion dollars? I have a $23 billion infrastructure deficit on things that will be needed every day, and yet I have to go to citizens and say, I need to spend your money, this money, on something that might never ever be used. And if you just do the math, to spend a half a billion dollars to prevent a one in 100 chance of $5 billion in damage, well, you'd never do that. You'd just spend the damage, except for two things. Is it one in 1 billion? Or one in 100 years, I should say? And is it $5 billion? And what is the human cost of that damage? So at this point, seven months after the disaster, it's easy for me to make the case to provincial and federal governments that this money has to be spent. If we don't do it now, a year from now, that case will be very difficult. So Sandra, you run a company that's, that's building some of this infrastructure. Is there a way to show mayors and presidents and prime ministers that that investment also helps them in the short term? That it isn't just an investment against long-term disaster, but actually can make them function more effectively in their terms of office? Um, thank you for this question. I have to say that uh, doing business in Japan and living in Japan, uh, basically we are living along with the natural disaster. So I think there is no other country probably spend or pay such a, a, a huge attention to build themselves resilient to the natural disaster. So I would say maybe, maybe a lot of people will criticize that Japan uh, because they was hard economically in the past decades. So those uh, uh, budgets, uh, yes, it did go down uh, quite, a, quite an amount. But I would say that the Japanese, no matter it's government or the private sector, we never neglect uh, to, to on those uh, hard infrastructure. So since that 1995 uh, Kobe earthquake, as a huge, you, you see all those from the TV, from the media. And after that, those building code and those earthquake proof uh, uh, improvement all adopted. So I can say that, or maybe you already see it from the TV, they are very limited damage uh, during that 311 earthquake. But all the thing is because that uh, tsunami. So I would like to say that uh, this day, when we're doing those, uh, when we are thinking about those uh, uh, disaster risk reduction, yes, we still, both the public and the private sector, we still. Uh, pay, uh, I mean, invest in the hot uh, infrastructure, no matter it's building our own manufacturer or the seawall. But we change the mindset. And then all those new policies have been revised. Now we understand that, especially after this tsunami, we cannot protect ourselves 100%, but we can prevent and reduce the impact 
as much as we can. So, and that is the way that uh, it's not only the hard infrastructure, but we combine the hard infrastructure and the soft infrastructure, soft measurement together. They can help us uh, to, I think the most important thing is save people's life rather than protect the status quo. Mm -hmm. So this is a very important uh, uh, mindset changed, uh, even though people think that uh, Japan is a very well-prepared country, but whole the DRR, disaster risk reduction mindset have do, uh, changed due to this 311. And I would like to emphasize uh, uh, about this uh, uh, soft infrastructure and the measurement. I think this is something that we can share, I mean, for, from Japan can share with the world is, yes, as after the 1995 Kobe, there is like an early warning system, phone-based, um, or those uh, manual operation, a drill, uh, uh, evacuation practice. We have been done and, and practiced every year. But now, it's, it's more, we need to have a more innovation about, uh, let's say, uh, the auto manufacturer, the utilizing those uh, GIS GPS and then can provide those uh, real-time uh, evacuation option and also can active and accelerate those uh, uh, rescue active, which is, this is, I think, is very important. And then, for not just only those, uh, uh, those infrastructure, but also the practice, we will, help, uh, we will work together with the government and even the community and how to practice this is just not rely on the hard infrastructure, but how to you know, run when you hear any, uh, when the tsunami come, when earthquake come, you have to follow where to run or what to do. So this is something uh, is very important. I, I read in the recovery report after the tsunami um, that your commission did that m 10 times more girls or women drowned than men mm. yes. in the tsunami because girls we in Japan didn't learn how to swim. No, no. Uh -huh. So <laughs> at least that was their assertion. So. Are you working on the soft, soft part of the responses? Yes, to yes. Uh, I, that's one thing that I say I will emphasize that the importance of the data collection. If we want to review or you want to do any prevention, you need to collect all the data because sometimes the, the disaster comes maybe once 100 years. Only 100 years, they come once. But if you collect all the data, you can immediately compare the data before and after. And you can immediately, immediately do all those. Uh, if you do keep the, those monitoring and uh, uh, evaluating, then you know how to do the response rescue. And then you know how to uh, learn from your lesson to do your reconstruction and prepare for the future. And last one thing I want to emphasize, very important, is it's not just uh, only the evacuation, it's how to prepare ourselves to be resilient to the future possible risk. So that is a continuity plan. Mm. So from the national continuity plan, community continuity plan, your building, and also our company. We are from the business society. So it, was been, it, it has been uh, encouraged to, for the private sector to adopt the business continuity plan. But this 311, <coughs> I say, it really accelerate the business society to emphasize and really invest on this uh, continuity plan. And this continuity plan cannot, will not just only prepare ourselves to be resilient. I think it's very important it can help the country and the, and the whole, I mean, the business society to reduce its social and economic loss. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Domingo, we all have uh, images still of Typhoon Haiyan and the uh, horrific human cost. Um, and loss of lives, but for a moment, just to continue, since you're the Secretary of Trade and Industry on the business sector and the impact of these kinds of devastating events on business and the economy of a country, can first of all, can you share with us the kind of business recovery that's going on mm -hmm. and what the mechanisms are that you're putting in place to really think about that systematically? Yes. Uh, well. Ple uh, first, let me just put it in perspective. Uh, this uh, Typhoon Haiyan is uh, an event that I've never seen in my lifetime. So the uh, Philippines, I would say, is quite resilient in terms of uh, calamities because we're used to it. Uh, so I think in terms of a typhoon, we're probably geared up for a one in a 50-year event. But uh, this particular one was uh, one in one in a hundred year type of event, so they say, but 
a lot of these once in a hundred year events are occurring globally uh, so frequently that maybe we have a new normal, so we don't know. Now, in terms of the, the business disruption or economic impact, nationally, it's actually very little because it hit a part of the country which was uh, actually one of the poorest uh, parts of the country and which there is very little industrial activity. It's primarily agricultural and fishing and some handicraft. Uh, but in terms of the local eco economy, the local economy was devastated uh, because uh, what happened after Typhoon Haiyan is the electricity was cut the water was cut, the roads were totally impassable, not a single road was possible. The port, the seaport was closed because the equipment was destroyed, the airport was closed, and uh, so all of these things had to be worked on, and all the businesses were closed, 100%, not a single one was left operating. Cell sites were all down, all the trees were down. So in terms of the impact on the lo local economy, very big impact. Uh, so now uh, the, the government is uh, doing a lot of efforts now to, to bring business back to its feet. Of course, it starts with uh, financing assistance. So all the agencies of government that are helping, especially in the SMEs, are, have opened their windows of financing. There's also, government also has uh, been giving uh, money to, to those who were affected. Uh, starting with uh, support for reconstruction of their homes, to to support for for to things like cash for work programs. So those uh, because we have a lot of because it was a very poor area, there were a lot of people who were just uh, uh, doing small types of businesses, uh, selling foods, retail, uh, small retail operations, and. Uh, so uh, as a replacement for that temporary loss of income, the government, the pro and actually a lot of uh, aid uh, agencies, NGOs, were also doing the same thing, doing cash for work programs. So you do some work, clear the roads, uh, do this, uh, help rebuild the house, then they pay you money. So, uh, but we're also launching a, a, a series of additional assistance where we're now gonna be provide, we're now waiting for approval of a proposal, for example, wherein what we call merchant seeding program, where we, we train people to sell certain stuff, how to do accounting, and then we provide them with an initial batch of things to sell. And then when they're successful, they come back, and then we give them additional mer merchandise for free. No, no, no payment, so that, that can get the ball rolling. You know, uh, the global data show that 25% of SMEs globally never reopen yeah. after yeah. a disaster like this. And here we're talking about job creation and um, unemployment and the like. When you think that a quarter of the economy goes down every year um, somewhere in terms of these disasters, it's yet another huge reason why we've got to think about this in a, in a completely different way. Um, when Baroness Amos started, she talked about the development aid as one bucket and the humanitarian aid as another and each agency responsible for their own piece of this. Again, a chilling statistic for $3 of every development aid given a dollar is lost um, to these kinds of crises. You now, Prime Minister, get money in, in a variety of ways, whether it's post-emergency relief or development aid or private investment, which you've been amazing in, in really um, galvanizing for, for your country. How do you think about orchestrating the financing in a way? Are you agnostic about the dollars? Are you the sort of leverage point for how public-private partnerships develop? How are you thinking about all of these buckets of money? I know it's not enough, but in, in using them in some way that really provides some kind of catalytic leverage. Well, one of the, I mean, one of the key areas, of course, was when we came in was a gigantic task of rebuilding a country with very little resources. 
Um, most of the, the aid that came to Haiti came as humanitarian emergency relief. And that was very necessary at the time. And, um, you know, we had 4,000 Olympic pools worth of rubbles, for example, that we had to remove. We had a situation where, you know, all 1.5 million people or 50% of the capital's inhabitants were left homeless and were living in tents on the streets. And uh, so we needed to very quickly find financing in order to, to relocate them. So we had a program called 166 that we put together with NGOs, with, with international uh, development agencies, and with the government, with the government leadership, to relocate the people into the original neighborhoods, fixing their homes, and providing them a rent subsidy for a year, and, and a stipend to also open a micro, a micro enterprise in order for them to, to get by and, and, and maybe um, open a, a, small, a small shop selling um, you know, basic groceries mm -hmm. um, for the community. And that has been one of the most successful uh, projects that this government has had since we, were, um, since we came in because it showed that the, 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 the aid mechanism and the coordination, when, when, when done well, if it's government-led, of course, can produce positive results. And this has been an extraordinary um, program that has worked very well in, in, helping, in helping people. Now, this, of course, goes to the human impact, the infrastructure impact. We lost a port. We lost an airport. We lost uh, over 40% of housing were were destroyed, um, so so the, the infrastructure impact was great. How did we um, move from that to where we are today? Um, Haiti has had, of course, the the goodwill of the international community. So we have worked with many agencies trying to develop a, be a better coordination um, package, which we have done, um, called the CAIAD, which is a, an aid mechanism that, that identifies the need areas and that, that requests donors to focus on those areas. And many of them have done it, you know, have focused on different areas. So, for example, we have some donors that are focusing on, on education. We have clusters that are focusing on infrastructure, on, on health. And that has, that has worked pretty well. You know, if you look at the health statistics, the health indicators, they're all in green right now. Mm -hmm. And, and, of course, you know, it's, it's very challenging because in Haiti, everything is a challenge on, on a daily, it's development on a shoestring, basically. Mm -hmm. And that's never easy. So, um, and one of the areas that we're focusing on as we're talking about financing, and that's, the, that, that's a paradox, is when the country was hit by, this, uh, by, by the earthquake, we had $13 billion worth of damage, both infrastructure, um, and, and, and everything was destroyed. So we needed funds to, to rebuild. We got the funds in emergency. That was fine. Now we need to, to go into the nation building. And that's where we're having you know, challenges because we had a debt cancellation. We had $1.2 billion of debt that was canceled by, by the international institutions, but also it put Haiti in a, in a category seven where we're not able to, to, to lend. So we cannot go into the capital markets and what do we do? Because we have the, we have the country to rebuild. We're not getting quick enough on disbursement on the, on the nation building side. We did on the, on the humanitarian relief. We don't have access to, to capital markets to, to borrow. What do we do? And, uh, and, and you know, what I'm going to say here is going to sound different, but this is the reality. We have to rely heavily on, on an agreement that Haiti has with the government of Venezuela where that government provides us with discounted oil. Um, a 60, basically, we purchase oil from them. They send us a boatload every month. We pay 40% we, we pay of the invoice with a three-month grace period. And 60% and of the amount goes into a development account that, that's used for development projects. So right now, from 2008 till now, it, it amounted to about $1.3 billion. And that $1.3, the government, it's, it goes into um, budget support uh, in, in, our, in our budget. And every, every, every year, and that's what we used last year, we used $462 million of that fund in order to 
rebuild the country after Sandy. Um, and this is basically the only source of, of financing that the government has in order to, to finance its, its infrastructure projects. And this has been something that um, it's, it's, you know, it's God sent for us. As we're looking for private investment, mm -hmm. private, you know, foreign direct investment is up 25%, that, but that's $220 million for the year. Whereas, you know, the, 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 the Venezuela assistance amounts for close to $25 million per month. It's to give you an idea how much impact that, that it does and how much good that it's done to Haiti. And it's, it, it's, kept, up, it's, it's kept the government afloat and, and, and being able to finance our, our infrastructure. And if you come today, you will see that, you know, we are rebuilding over 700 kilometers of roads. We have, we're doing 10 hurricane shelters, for example. Um, we're investing into the drainage system. Um, you know, the country, you know, we're rebuilding seven ministries. 42 of them were knocked down after the earthquake. Five new airports. The airport of Port-au-Prince has been renovated. We're doing a new airport in Cap Haitian, one in the south and then two in the southeast. Um, we re we're rebuilding the port facility. So the country is moving forward, and that's, you know, that's done through creative financing because it's not, you know, we're not getting any more debt. Um, Sandra mentioned soft infrastructure. So are you also replanting trees and fortifying the coastline with, against coastal erosion and all of the more soft infrastructure kinds of? We are doing so. Of course, you know, we're trying to do a lot with little resources. And that's, uh, that's been also a very big challenge, is, is, tr is trying to do a lot with little. We have to prioritize where and how we do it. So, so the country has a big uh, deforestation. 98.5% mm -hmm. of the country um, is, uh, is deforestated right now. So we're doing different projects. You know, we have one going with uh, Professor Yunus and uh, Richard Branson to reforest 10,000 hectares. Uh, and, but that's, that's just you know, a beginning mm -hmm. as to what, what needs to be done on a shoestring. And, and I'd like to point that out because you know, we have to maximize the use of every dollar in order to make sure that it goes to where it's supposed to go and, and, and where it's most needed. And that's been also a, a big challenge in, into, the, into the planning phase of the development approach. Valerie, don't answer this if it's an unfair question, but if you, you've seen so much of, of all of this all over the world. If you had a magic wand and you could reorganize the financing mechanisms within development and humanitarian aid, what kind of structure would really enable both capacity building for the long term as well as this more immediate responding when the disaster hits? Uh, well, I think there is a huge gap in terms of uh, how you know, what are the incentives to help local government, national government, regional government to invest in preparedness? Uh, it's a really difficult challenge uh, to make a decision. Uh, we heard about it at the, the local level in terms of uh, Calgary, to be able to sell to your citizens that you are investing now for something that may happen in the future. And one of the things that really concerns me is that uh, we've seen a couple of examples uh, recently where uh, citizens have been prepared, very well prepared for something that might happen, and then when it doesn't happen, they sort of turn around and say to their, their governments, well, that was a kind of waste of time, <laughs> really. You, you sort of marched us up a hill, and then you had to march us uh, down again. So how do, you, how do you get the investment in uh, preparedness? And the World Bank have done some very good work, which uh, you know, shows that you know, we are investing cents in preparedness and lots of dollars mm -hmm. in response. Uh, so we have to really change this model. Uh, the second thing that um, I think we have to do is to uh, look at ways in which we can also invest very locally. Um, so it's about communities. I mean, the communities are the first responders. So it's about the communities and it's both in terms of culture change, uh, uh, as well as being about the local government structures. So it's this mix of the soft and the hard. It's both about infrastructure, but it's also about culture. Um, so I would 
change the financing uh, mechanisms. Uh, I would give a lot more support to the local uh, and really make the international the thing that comes in behind mm. last. I mean, we should be the last thing that comes in. And I think the investment as well in the public-private is absolutely crucial. We saw recently in the Philippines response a huge private sector uh, engagement in that. How do we best uh, coordinate that with what the government itself is doing as well as the broader international response? Maybe I can turn to the mayor as we talk again about the local level and really the, the kinds of uh, demands being made of mayors all over the world. We had many mayors invited to the forum this year and uh, had fantastic conversations, not only about risk and, and resilience, but about unemployment. And, and many of them made the point that the mayor is ground zero um, in many places around the world. And, and how do you really, you talked about a long-term project, but there must also be some shorter term projects that both build resilience and capacity for emergency and at the same time serve your citizens. I, I, we are um, promoting the development of bus rapid transit, mm -hmm. um, for example, because we know that it's great for transportation in the good times and it's phenomenal for transportation in the bad times. And so aren't there investments like that across the various sectors locally that could be a win-win? Wow, there's about five questions in there, and um, <laughs> I'll, try and, I'll try and hit them. So number one, yes, of course. Um, as we rebuild, um, as opposed to the things that are pure resilience, of course we're going to rebuild in a way that is thoughtful, that mitigates against future disaster and damage. Um, I want to highlight a couple of things, I think. And one is we've talked a lot about larger projects in terms of recovery and resilience and the role of governments. And I, and I want to make sure we don't miss one thing, which is the role of individuals and the remarkable mm -hmm. capacity that we have as human beings, uh, both to be resilient, but also to help our neighbors. Mm -hmm. And that's something that we saw very much uh, in, in our situation, that people were really able to come out and do great things. You know, one simple example is we needed to inspect homes before we could get people back into them. And that would have taken a long time with 40,000 homes. And what we were able to do was give people simple checklists you may re-enter your home, but go to the community center first, pick up some gloves and some boots. If there's water on the ground leading up to your front door, don't go in. If there's water in your basement above the bottom of the electrical outlet, go back to the, uh, to the community center. So in short, overnight, we created 35,000 building inspectors. And we were able to get people back into their homes much, much more quickly than we would have been able to do otherwise. And when we think about these small resilience projects, we have to remember part of that is people's own uh, little projects on their own. When you're rebuilding your home, move the fuse box out of the basement. Yeah. You know, simple things like that that actually make a huge difference. And government policy can really help make that work. In our, in our case, our provincial government has said, if you apply for disaster relief, we will give you extra funding that will be specifically for resilience on your individual property. But you must do it in order to be eligible for future funding. So these things, I think, are smart, common sense situations to try and decentralize the work that's done. I do want to say something about your point about mayors being ground zero. Um, and I know the prime minister and others would agree with this, but this is a significant leadership challenge for those of us in public service. And certainly, we enter public service in order to serve. And I never, ever want to go through what we went through this year again. Yeah. But at the same time, uh, it does give us lessons in terms of public leadership that I think are helpful. And we made uh, two decisions at the beginning, which I later learned are not common decisions and disasters, but they were very quickly done at the beginning. And number one was, if we knew anything, the public needed to know the same thing. Unless there was a compelling public safety reason to hold back information, the information had to flow, even if it was bad news. And there never was a public safety reason to hold back the information, so we revealed everything. And the second was, to put me, this funny face, front and center. Um, and the reason for that was not because I really love doing press conferences or briefings or because I'm a subject matter expert. The reason for that was because citizens knew who I was. And when extremely difficult messages are being delivered, when people need reassurance, 
when they need a sense of hope that things are going to be better, it's very difficult for the director of emergency management, whom they've never seen before, to be able to deliver that message. And I think as politicians and public servants, it's very, very important, not for the photo op, view in the jacket with the paddles or whatever, um, but really important because that trust has already been built with the community to make sure that as these messages are being delivered, they're being delivered by people whom the citizens have faith in. And, and, and it's true that mayors are ground zero. People really identify with their mayors. And, and my message to my colleagues in this job is that it's very important for us to be out front in these things. I think that's critical. I want to emphasize in a different way your first point, and then Valerie, jump in. Um, Tom Frieden, who is the uh, head of the Centers for Disease Control in the US, recently spoke. And he said his experience in all of the pandemics, and he was also the health commissioner in New York City before, was be honest, be transparent, give the citizens the data, tell them the information, even if it's bad news, that in the end, that was one of the most important lessons that he learned in recovery, whether it was a health issue or um, a natural disaster of, of one sort. And often, our public officials are loath to do that. They feel that it makes the public nervous. They don't have all the answers yet. Um, and yet, uh, people are arguing, those who are in these um, important positions, that it's really the opposite. Valerie. I wanted to agree 100% with the communication point, but I wanted, if I may, to, to, to put a question to the minister from uh, the Philippines, uh, which relates to the points that have been made about the importance of building back better. Uh, because I think the Prime Minister alluded to some of the challenges of building back better in a difficult and challenging environment, which is the case in Port-au-Prince, and is very much the case in the Philippines uh, post uh, Typhoon Haiyan, which is not just about Haiyan, but the fact that this is a country which is very disaster uh, prone. And actually, um, and uh, Minister, I hope I'm not putting you uh, 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 in too much of a difficult position by asking you this, but if you look at some of the uh, research that the government itself has done, with respect to where you relocate people to, that actually the government doesn't necessarily have as wide a range of choices as it would like to have, given that the Philippines is essentially a chain of islands, many of them quite uh, small. So relocating uh, uh, people from what we would sometimes think of as moving them away from uh, a disaster prone area isn't as easy to do in a country like the Philippines as it might be somewhere else. And I just wondered what challenges that created for the government in terms of these issues around building back better. Yeah, well, Typhoon Haiyan has uh, really made, made the Philippine government uh, rethink everything uh, when it comes to disaster management and uh, resiliency issues. So we're definitely gonna redraft the disaster response manual. We are now doing thousands of simulations uh, in the entire Philippines uh, to see which areas are disaster prone, whether it be with storm surges or earthquake um, areas, and then appropriate policies will be done. But uh, right now they're already determining, at least in the immediately affected areas, the no-build no zones, for example, uh, we will be reviewing building codes and coming up with new ones. And they may not be applicable to the entire country, but it might, the building codes may be different for depending on the type of uh, rating you get in terms of the disaster uh, risk. And uh, the, for example, the immediate decision in those areas was already uh, 40 meters back, that nobody can build on those that were swamped with uh, the storm surge of 47 meter water. So they will not be allowed to rebuild uh, within 40 meters of the shore. Uh, but that's still being, that's still conditional. It's being implemented now, but that could still be subject to change depending on the results of the simulations. Um, not, not the entire Philippines is uh, disaster prone. It's mostly the eastern part uh, because that's where all the storms come from. And uh, as, so as a result of this, everything will be overhauled. Uh, the, I just wanted to make another point. 
because you you mentioned earlier about the accountability of the aid that's given. Uh, one, the the aid comes in in two forms. Uh, one is in in kind. This could be tents. This could be food. This could be in the forms of ships, aircraft that are used in the disaster response or ferrying goods. And they, they come in also in the form of cash. Now, in terms of kind, those are executed basically by the countries that d donate them. For example, the aircrafts, the ships, uh, a lot of the food is distributed directly as well by, by the foreign aid agencies and by the countries that donate them. Uh, but we account for that. In fact, the Philippines, as part of its governance effort and transparency, came up with a website. I, I just can't recall the, the website uh, itself, but I can give you that later. Wherein they show all the donations to the Philippine government in cash and in kind, uh, in terms of pledges, in terms of the, what, what, how much was actually received, and where it went. So we have that website available to anyone. That's great. So, Second, uh, in terms of cash, the Philippine government, of all the announced uh, donations, the Philippine government receives less than 10% of cash. Because especially, let's say, if a uh, multinational announces that it's donating $2 million, $5 million, $10 million, uh, most multinationals are not allowed to donate to the government. So they announce it as a donation to the Philippines, but it actually goes to Red Cross, mm -hmm. it goes to World Food Program, it goes to Save the Children. So, but let's say we, the, 10, the 5 to 10 percent that we receive, it's all accounted for in the website now. Yeah. Good, that's okay. great. Listen, Can um, I, I just want to make the accountability, please, that we also run something called a financial tracking service, which does exactly the same thing for um, all the countries around the world. So. All that donors have to do, and it's for in-kind and cash contributions, is to just uh, uh, let us know, basically, uh, that this contribution has been made to a country, and that is tracked as well. Because very often, a lot of contributions are made by you know, individuals, by companies, uh, in-kind, which nobody knows about, but it's there. So we, we have something similar for us. Uh, all of the countries. Those are the world. crucial. I want to make one point, and then Sandra, I'm going to turn to you, and then I will open it to the audience. Um, we, I, and this is a, an important devil's advocate point. Um, Superstorm Sandy followed a completely different track than any hurricane that had gone up the northeast for the last 45 years. And so we have learned in New York not to say anymore. We think this area is hurricane prone and we think that area is not hurricane prone. The idea of this is really to say to yourself, uh, there's a degree of risk, so clearly you're, but there's so much uncertainty now about the course of some of these shocks and storms that a, a broader language around preparedness may be the new narrative of the 21st century. So we're hearing that in a lot of these conversations really for the first time. We can't prepare for everything and the last storm isn't, or the last 20 years of storm may not be the best predictor of, of where and what the next, the next shock will be. Sandra, the Prime Minister has talked so much in Japan about investment now in infrastructure as one of the mechanisms for um, stimulating the economy and, and uh, continuing to uh, move it into a different kind of growth pattern. Is the conversation there linked, though, to resilient infrastructure, to risk capacity, um, or are they still separate conversations? And, and how do you see it? Definitely. Uh, those uh, public investments definitely include, include uh, those uh, investments. Uh, no matter it's infrastructure, hard or soft, or uh, to the, to to address the future or further uh, possible risk. But before I answer you that, because we talk about, heard about lots of those of finance and uh, mayors say, I want to give you something that really can reference because I do believe that uh, uh, the the community is very important 
uh, during those, uh, uh, how to maintain and how to make the community resilient is very important during those natural disasters. So to those uh, individual, uh, very important. Equally, the SMB or the, the corporate for the business sector, actually they are, they, you know, all those stakeholders, either they are our clients, our employee, or they are our uh, contractor. So if our business sector, we can really make ourselves resilient and continue it and make ourselves can, uh, sustainable uh, when the disaster happens. Actually, that's really helpful to the, the community. And, and one case I can give you a reference in Japan is the, uh, the Investment Bank of Japan. They encouraged the private sector to have their own business uh, continuity plan, uh, and they will give the rating. If you have the BCP, then the uh, IBJ will provide you a premium loan mm. for the loan, which is helpful and really can encourage that. And not only that, um, we our uh, the business company, the business sector. We will work very closely with the local government. And one form in Japan is we call it uh, emergency agreement, and it's so uh, it's well uh, un, uh, well uh, known as a bonsai kyote in this DRM uh, society. So this is everything because it, it's very difficult to get those coordination and communication uh, uh, after the disaster happens. So you have to really put everything in place before the disaster happened. And this is kind of like a prevention. So those agreements you can be put with the government, central government and local government, and also the local government with the private sector. So you see uh, in 311, there's no panic in Japan because everything we understand is all arranged there. So they can cover like a role uh, the recovery, all those construction. So you see all those, uh, probably people got attention by the tsunami, but all those road, railway, airport, they got recovered and restored within one week or at most two weeks because everything is well prepared. But we also learn from this, uh, uh, this 311. So many things we have to improve. Uh, more those facility and services because not only those are uh, placed on, on the, uh, the people on the site, but also people, they are far from those earthquake uh, disaster uh, 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 the place, the people in Tokyo just cannot go home. So how we can, uh, that the government decided to make those agreement with the shopping mall, with those the big building, if they cannot go home, those are shopping mall at the building, they will put those generator, blanket, food, water there and make them the safe staying in, in those building. So this, this kind of lot of the agreements being uh, uh, implemented. So we have five minutes left. What I'm going to do is ask for three questions in a row, not speeches, but questions, um, and then allow each of our panelists a minute for a response. Sir? I'm Nicolas Marista from Mexico. Uh, do you know Mexico is also involved in many disasters? We just, uh, we've been involved here with the World Economic Forum. Uh, we signed an agreement recently with the engineering construction sector. We got involved in this. And we got it, and we just signed it, as, I, as I've been saying. Because as you all been saying, the sector where I belong to, which is uh, construction, we can play a major role in natural disasters. So, but we have to work very close with the local governments. Otherwise, it won't be possible. So my question is, I would like to hear some of your comments. How could we, because how do you inv get involved with local people, the, uh, and get, uh, with local uh, contractors and investors? We have done that in Mexico. But I would like to hear some other comments. Thank you. Uh, other questions, involved. yes. Hi, I'm Michelle Walker with the World Policy Institute in New York. Uh, you've talked about some of the, the warning systems, the, the roadmaps for what to do when there's a storm coming. But in every case, you have people who don't want to do it. The people in New York who didn't evacuate for, for Superstorm Stan Sandy because Irene was a total disappointment the year before. People in all of your countries who- So question? Who won't do it. How do, you, how do you handle those people? How do you change that behavior for the better? And the last question? the role of natural infrastructure into consideration in preparedness. All right, any of the questions that you want to answer in one minute or less? I'll start with you and just go down the row. Valerie? Um, I'll take the culture shift uh, uh, question. And I think that um, you have to change behavior over time. 
Uh, and, you know, it's not going to happen immediately. I think that the, the culture shift has to be two-way. Uh, one is that people have to understand that uh, it is better to be prepared and for something not to happen than uh, to be uh, not to be prepared and something does happen. And this is a major culture shift. But I think at the same time, we have to accept that people are individual. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it was very interesting when I went to the Philippines and um, one of the uh, islands I went to, the mayor actually threatened to lock people up if they didn't evacuate. Mm -hmm. uh, and he did actually lock up one or two people. Mm. It's an extreme... <laughs> Uh, uh, approach to take, and I think in the United States it wouldn't work, <laughs> but it it worked in that particular instance. There, an answer to any of the questions. <laughs> I'm going to no, I'm going to go down the row. Yes, we have to be engaged with the private sector, particularly the construction industries, to help us come up with new codes and better codes, and to build in resilience in what we do. Number two, give people really practical things that they can do. Charge your devices. Fill your bathtub, things like that, and, and help them understand and, and be human about it. Use a mix of, don't scare people, but use a mix of facts. Come straight forward, sometimes cajoling and teasing, teasing people. If you want to really have some fun, Google Nenshi Darwin Law, and you'll see what I said to people who wanted to go out on the river um, <laughs> during the flooding, um, which is basically that I wasn't allowed to just let them invoke the Darwin Law. And, uh, and it was selfish to re require the first responders to do that. But I think being human in that way and helping really translate things to people's individual lives and what you need to do really helped us with a lot of that, uh, of people actually abiding by what needed to do. And yes, of course the natural infrastructure is important. One of the key provisions with our flood was the simple fact that there's been so much development upstream of Calgary and the Rocky Mountains that changed the permeability of the ground. Concrete didn't absorb the water. It wouldn't have anyway because of the flash storms, but it certainly made it worse. And so to think about things like permeability, tree cover, um, natural um, uh, enhancement of riverbanks, incredibly important. Agree. Yeah. Uh, well, dealing with people, uh, sometimes uh, in, the, in the Philippines case, the terminology could have made a big difference, and there was a debate about this, because uh, people didn't understand what a storm surge is. If they had said tsunami, you didn't even have to arrest them because before you could finish your sentence, they would have been gone out of there. <laughs> um, and then, and, uh, so, oh, by the way, on, on uh, just an additional comment, that, that mayor who uh, threatened to arrest people was going to arrest them on attempted suicide. Of course, there's no such thing. <laughs> <laughs> but on the contractors, it was very easy in the Philippines case because there was one central agency assigned to do all the rebuilding, which is the Department of Public Works and Highways. I, I, Quick answer. I think... Um, one thing is very important is the mindset and how we think about it. Be positive. Because I do believe that uh, uh, building resilience to the natural disaster cannot, is not a standalone issue. It helps protect saving life and it also helps to reduce the impact from the climate change and the development goals, sustainable development goals cannot be achieved if we don't build ourselves. Uh, resilient to those natural disasters. So I see Japan is, we are taking a, not a defense approach, but a more offense approach to, is an active attempt to, to, to address the future and the further risk. And for us, I think all the citizens and all the business sector, together with the uh, public sector, and all the members here in our WF members, we think about that if we should take it as integral issues and we work along, we work together and to make sure that we are resilient and to, be, to build, build ourselves and build the whole world even better. Thank you. And Mr. Mr. Prime Minister, the last word. Um, prevention and communication with the people. In, in Haiti, we had the earthquake and then we had the superstorm Sandy. So. We had a situation where we needed to evacuate people that were actually affected by the earthquake, living in, in, in refugee camps, and not wanting to leave the refugee camps when Superstorm Sandy was going to hit. So, and we, and we were talking about close to 10,000 people that were living in, in that camp, and, and it, it was in a flood area. So the president and myself had to go before, because you know there, there was a strong chance that this was going to be flooded and the, and the people would be affected, so we had to go personally, and and uh, 
convince them, talking to the leaders, to, to relocate into nearby schools. And, and that in itself was not a solution. So, but it helped in that particular case save lives. So, so it's not only in New York that people don't want to leave you know, the, uh, their places. In, in that instance, they, they didn't want to leave uh, uh, an IDP camp. And uh, you know, of course, with communication, constant re reinforcement of showing what could happen to them. You know, being on the radio, being with with, with local uh, local leaders. You know, and 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 driving home the message. You know, is key to to saving lives and uh, and being more resilient. That, that's that's certainly what we're using in constant communication at the grassroots level. Please join me in thanking our incredible panel.